Afternoon. Uh, this question is actually for Saif Um It's pretty straightforward, and I think I think it's a key to get an answer. Not necessarily today. I think it's an evolving question. Basically, the question is: What technical challenges must we overcome before we experience we, everybody in the world, or at least a majority of the people, can enjoy a free money like Bitcoin? so that everybody can enjoy the benefits, not just the small people, the small kind of people that have acquired it? That's the question. Okay. I think the real challenge is not so much technical. I think Bitcoin is operational as it is, and it's been working for 12, 13 years. Um, on the base layer, it works fine. It does about uh, up to half a million transactions a day. Obviously, that's not going to be anywhere near enough for the whole world to do all of their transactions. But what I argue in the Bitcoin standard is that uh, we need to think of base layer transactions in Bitcoin as being more like settlement transactions between financial institutions rather than consumer payments. Consumer payments can be built on secondary layers, and we already have all the secondary layers that are existing. They can all be adapted to Bitcoin. So um, Visa, MasterCard, they already support about 150 fiat currencies. They can do 151, and all they need to do is just start buying some Bitcoin. So all of the, um, I mean, I, I'm not going to say it's trivial, but it's, it, it, th th there's no technical hurdle that is uh, standing in the way of more Bitcoin adoption. I think the real hurdle is economical. It's, it's, it's an economic problem, which is that 100% of people's cash balances today, or uh, about 99 plus percent of people's cash balances are not Bitcoin. And um, it's people hold their cash balances in government currencies, but they also hold government bonds, and they also hold real estate as a cash substitute, and they hold uh, stock indices. All of these things are substitutes for holding cash, money that you want to hold for the long term. So the challenge really is how do these people um, change their uh, cash reserves from uh, fiat-denominated assets into Bitcoin? And this is not like uh, switching from uh, Android to Apple. It's not a question of switching from one form of uh, consumer product to another because it's a very complicated liquidity question. So if you're a business, you have all of your, you know, you're a business operating in the fiat world, all of your income is in fiat and all of your uh, expenditures are in fiat. And you have these constant obligations that come every day. You know, people pay you every day and you pay other people every day. And all of that is in fiat, so you have to hold a cash balance in fiat. Um, and you can't just switch 100% to Bitcoin because of the volatility in the value um, and because of the transaction costs that would be involved. So you can't switch completely. And it's not something that, you know, uh, Bitcoin is not a product of central planning. We're not going to get a government that's just going to say, all right, everybody's bonds are marked to zero, and here, uh, take Bitcoin instead. Nobody can do that. Nobody can print Bitcoin to hand it out, and nobody can annul uh, other inst uh, other um, stores of value in favor of Bitcoin. So it's going to be a gradual market process, and this is exactly what we're seeing. The value of Bitcoin goes up, and the number of, and the amount of Bitcoin held on cash balances continues to increase, while fiat cash balances uh, decline in real value. And, uh, we're still at a point where Bitcoin is less than 1%, but I think um, um, as the price goes up, you know, we're going to see this gradually happen. So a business will first hold 5% in Bitcoin, and then as Bitcoin appreciates, they're able to hold more and more and more, and then more of their clients and more of their customers will start being able, willing to pay in Bitcoin. And so gradually we'll see this kind of transformation take place. And of course, it's going to be significantly hastened and um, sped up if any of these fiat currencies fail. So people will switch much faster to uh, Bitcoin in that case. Thank you. I also have a question about Bitcoin for Mr. Amos primarily. Uh, let me preface by saying I'm a big fan of Bitcoin. I've been using it actively for more than 10 years and I'm heavily invested in it. But there's one thing I worry about, which is the possibility that governments might ban it in, in, some, in some way. So what would happen if major governments started introducing some kind of bans against using Bitcoin, trading Bitcoin? Obviously, we could still use Bitcoin. The blockchain would still exist. We could use the technology still. but if it's illegal, then obviously very few people would actually be willing to do it. So what would happen in this kind of scenario? Could, could Bitcoin still remain viable? Could it be a sort of underground technology? And how would it affect the price of Bitcoin? 
Um, I, I would say the short answer is that Bitcoin is uh, optimized for this kind of operating environment where it is uh, not favored by governments. And it's designed in a way where it will be able to survive something like a, a very powerful government crackdown. Um, you know, you won't be able to pay for your coffee and lunch with Bitcoin in that kind of world, but it'll continue to survive. It'll continue to make a block every 10 minutes. So when you, when you think of it surviving in spite of this massive crackdown, then that changes the rationale for what government should do. So if they do crack down on it and it continues to survive, they're basically doing two things. A, they're advertising Bitcoin's resilience and advertising Bitcoin's uh, value proposition, which is here, you know, we are trying to kill this thing, but we can't kill it. And um, B, they're advertising their, uh, their own weakness. So Bitcoin's value proposition is that it is money outside the control of the state. And if the state clamps down on it and fails, then that massively increases it. But I think from the other side, um, I, I think I, I would have expected the last 10 years to have witnessed a serious government crackdown on Bitcoin. And when I first heard about Bitcoin, I spent many years thinking, well, you know, I wouldn't touch this because they're going to start throwing people in Guantanamo Bay for touching Bitcoin. And that was a very expensive mistake, it turns out, because they didn't come after people who use Bitcoin. They didn't throw them in Guantanamo. And Bitcoin's price just kept going up. So I think what we see is that um, a lot of people in government are beginning to realize the value proposition and realize that this is a very powerful technology. Instead of banning it, what you want to do is you want to own it. So I, I like to liken it to gunpowder or dynamite. When gunpowder is invented, all the world's armies were running on swords and sticks. And um, if you had a strong army and you heard about the country next door have developed dynamite, um, I don't think the smart thing to do would be to ban dynamite in your country or to ban gunpowder because what ends up happening is, you know, you can, y you can ban it for your own soldiers, but you can't ban it from the people who are going to shoot at your soldiers. And so um, what ends up happening is that dynamite is going to come into your country, but uh, one way or the other is going to come. Either you're going to give it to your soldiers or somebody else is going to shoot it at your soldiers and then replace your soldiers with their soldiers. And I think Bitcoin is a little bit like that. And I think more and more people are beginning to see it this way, that um, first of all, you can't win a war against Bitcoin because it's just designed to survive um, no matter how, uh, how much government pressure is against it. And secondly, if you fight it, all that you're doing is you're, A, as I said earlier, advertising it, but also giving your opponents uh, a, a, an, uh, an advantage in being able to accumulate it instead of you. So it's like, you're banning dynamite and you're letting your neighbors accumulate more and more dynamite. Perhaps there will be a massive government attack on Bitcoin, but I think with every passing day, it, it's growingly normalized as part of global financial markets and this becomes less, less likely of a scenario. Well, Thorsten, since we have a gold expert on the stage also, what, what is, what is your, <laughs> Thorsten, polite, um, what, is your, what is your estimation of, uh, of it? your view on the function of gold and uh, Bitcoin as a alternative for today's um, you know, monet possible monetary crisis. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for the question. I, I think gold is still the ultimate means of payments in this world. It's a thousand year, 5,000 year tested means of payment, of exchange. There's certain features that, makes, uh, that make it unique. It's scarce, it's homogenous. Uh, it's actually perfect money, I would say. And, um, it, you know, gold, in comparison now maybe uh, to, to Bitcoin, uh, one feature that's often overlooked is gold is, uh, there's a demand for gold for a variety of reasons, uh, namely uh, technology or dentist, uh, dentistry, uh, industrial purposes, and the monetary demand. And even if, no one would go ask for gold for monetary purposes. There would still be a demand for gold for other purposes. So the, the, the chances that gold will, will become worthless at any point in time is basically zero. With Bitcoin, it's different. Bitcoin has just one demand, the, the demand for money, or the or people hope that it at some point will serve as money. Now, 
assume that a Bitcoin uh, 0.2 enters the market, which is as good as the, the current Bitcoin, except it has one feature that makes it special. Then the price of the current Bitcoin could, down, could go down to zero because the demand would collapse. So that's, I, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but that's, that's a difference any investor should keep in mind. And um, the great advantage of, of, of the Bitcoin is, is the idea that you can escape from the power grip of governments. You know, that you can move somewhere where the government cannot tax you and cannot see what you're doing in terms of monetary uh, exchanges. I, I think a, a mo a money in a modern economy, must, uh, the, there must be an intermediation process, by which I mean people want to hold their money not only on their personal USB stick or on, the, on, their, on their computer drive at home, but places somewhere else where it's um, safeguarded. So people typically demand banking services. And uh, that, I think, is also the case in Bitcoin at, at the moment. Most people do not have the private key, but many, I speak for myself, um, hold their Bitcoin at a, a trading platform, for instance. And the reason why I do it is I, I feel comfortable, you know, and uh, they can charge me for this, I I'm happy to pay for it. And once you have this intermediation uh, process in place, then the government starts breathing down your neck. And um, so I cannot imagine that Bitcoin can really become a widespread means of exchange under current conditions. If the government would go, if we would get rid of government interventionism and we would have a, free mar a truly free market in money. I'm not that sure that Bitcoin would outperform or outdo or have all the advantages over, for instance, having uh, a digitalized gold or silver money standard. But uh, to conclude, uh, imp the important point is to get nearer to uh, free market in money, to put pressure on governments, and that's a brilliant and most uh, favorable development, more than we ask, can ask for at the moment. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not really sure. But I mean, the, the Bitcoin, as far as I can see it, will retain uh, its market. You know, it's going to here to stay. I think the interesting question is really how far it can still expand. And, uh, but uh, maybe for all of you who consider putting your money uh, into certain investments, uh, maybe diversification is, is a good approach. So, so put some money into Bitcoin, but not all of it in Bitcoin. Put some of it into gold, but not all of your money into gold. My question is for Juan. Uh, so with, uh, if, if we accept that human bodies are um, capital goods, how would, how would macroeconomic analysis use this? How would it change? What, what, what would we see, do you think, if, uh, if human bodies were taken into account? Thank you, Greg, for the question. Um, yeah, we would see all sorts of activities that, as, as, we, as, as I said, uh, the good character of certain activities wasn't even recognized a hundred years ago. You, we have new professions, we have new trades, we have new arts, technical, <laughs> technical activities and, and inventions, etc. So all of these would have to be valued because Menger not only criticized three, three uh, definitions of, of capital at the microeconomic level, he actually also spoke of uh, capital as a, as a, as, as a macroeconomic um, dimension or category. And he was very clear again on, this, on his 1888 work uh, about capital not being uh, something that we can do in the aggregate although he accepted, a, you know, like, a, for the lack of a better term, you can use a national capital or something like that. But he was very clear about it having to be a, an individual valuation. And it's not, my, my point was not that the body is a capital good, but the body can be a capital good for some people at, at certain points. And it's only advancing. We're beginning to recognize this. And all future capital investments and in, in, enhancements in your body and your brain, et cetera, 
uh, may have to be recognized by your employer, et cetera, but it's already happening with insurance and, and you know, major figures in different arts and, and trades. Okay, thank you. Well, Tim, you said that the militia uh, is, is actually the priority of everything, basically. Now, what about secession? Do, do uh, people or govern or regions first build up an army to, to have a, a good secession process? Or, I mean, basically also the war, the, the civil war in, 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 uh, in America, you know, two militias fighting each other? Thank you for the question. I think the priority is to preserve peace and to avoid conflict as much as possible. And I believe that Professor Hoppe's work in this area also about successful su uh, secession movement would require a posture of non-provocation, at least especially, I should say, in the initial stages. So to allow the powers that be to carry on their activities just without the support of that local region, to allow them access to their facilities unimpeded, unobstructed, at least initially, until one can reasonably expect to secure their territory. But the first thing, the first step of secession would be the nullification piece, is to make sure that you don't provide any support to the quote unquote enemy. Once a de declaration of Having an, our own territory, it would be essential to gather strength and to avoid any provocations that might lead to any type of harsh penalties. But it's about, at this point, it's about legitimacy rather, rather than relative power. Relative power would be able to overwhelm any type of security forces in a small polity. So again, it's having that recognition and part of that recognition is to be legitimate in your own internal fortification. So build strength militarily, take care of one's own laws, protect property, but try not to be antagonistic to those around you. And ultimately, economic integration is the greatest security. So in the event of a crisis or some type of collapse, the solution is not necessarily the gun, the solution is the network, the community. And that's the greatest sense of integration that would lead to better security, I think. But the ability to resist in the extreme is indispensable and again, I think it's valid to have that capacity, that martial capacity, whether it be a minimal state or the ideal of a completely private law society. Uh, I have a question for Tim as well. And um, you know, in um, most European countries, in most countries, uh, possessing weapons is very difficult. It's close to impossible. And uh, we are very far from the ideal of the Second Amendment of, and of the militia. And my question is, how could we, in Europe especially, and especially in these times when there would be the necessity of fighting governments and resisting governments, even on a military basis, how could we move from point A, where we are now, so basically citizens without any arms and exposed to government violence, to point B, where we could come closer to a militia or something like that. Do you have any suggestions how we could move towards this, this direction? My focus would be more on the institution building rather than the arms. Initially, the institutions of police, share in the US we have police and sheriff, but they don't exist in the Constitution. So the idea of placing the police or the sheriff or the whatever the enforcement entity under a committee of citizen activists that are involved in the day-to-day decision-making would be part of that institution building. Now, 
focusing on the right to keep and bear arms for self-defense and things along those lines is not looked at as so legitimate. And they're trying to bring that type of argument to the United States that you don't need this type of firearm for hunting or things along those lines. What I was trying to convey earlier, that it's really not about the weapons themselves, it's about who is in charge of executing the laws, who is the enforcement authority in a given geographic territory. And the message is, it has to be about self-governance rather than about having a top-down structure. And so the idea of changing legitimacy of who is executing the law, and it's going to require that sea change within the mentality of the people, that they are in charge of their own security and having a hand in directly contracting with whoever else is going to provide that supplementary security. So I wouldn't focus on the weapons so much but more about the institution building. And then from there, you start to gain more confidence in the ability to secure the right to keep and bear arms, but it's more about the organizations and the institutions. Uh, my question is to Tim again. Do you, um, do you think it's, it's, uh, it's a good way to think about outsourcing defense? That outsourcing defense always brings uh, risks with it. Like any, any kind of outsourcing brings risk. People can uh, steal your secrets. They're not really loyal to you. They're an outside organization or something like that. And when we, th when we think about defense or self-defense, it's, it's best, the closest is it, it is to us, right? The, the, if, if, we re if we defend ourselves on, a, on a, like a household level and then like a neighborhood level, it's, what, I, what I mean to say that it, it, it is probably best when, it, when you do it yourself, but then it's a little, violence is a little nasty and, and, the, and the wealthier you get, the, the, the higher in status you get, the, the further away you want to get from that possibly. So people are tempted to uh, outsource, it, outsource, outsource the, the, the defensive violence that, that needs to be done for them. And that, is, that will always bring risk and there will always be this push and pull between how much violence are you actually willing to, uh, to do in, when you want to defend yourself and, and or, or or maybe you can't take it and you need to you need someone else to do it and maybe some kind of how to prepare yourself for that as well or do you or do you think not everyone needs to be a warrior basically short answer is not everyone needs to be a warrior however but there's the eternal struggle between power and market and vigilance is the price of liberty and you cannot 100% outsource your security without expecting those others to take advantage of the position. So again, self-governance requires engagement. And that is the mentality that needs to change. It's difficult within libertarian communities to organize individualistic personalities. It's like herding cats. Yet at the same time, Property is a social function. Robinson Crusoe, alone on his island, doesn't need property rights. Property is about enforcing or signaling proper behavior in human relationships. So to give a monopoly or to outsource the decision making to someone else creates the incentive structure for them to take advantage of that position. So the contract has to be severable. But if they have all the arms and they have all the organization, then of course they can alter the terms of the deal unilaterally and then start to enforce things that the customer might not have wanted. And we're starting to see that in the realm of big tech. They're starting to look more and more like states. They're starting to perform more and more like states and they're starting to merge with the existing states. So the capacity to enforce that severability needs to be held from the client. And as I indicated, those territories that might have more money than time might do less of their own militia work and outsource that to a market provider, whether it be an insurance company or a mercenary firm. That's what the rough combination is. And when it comes to libertarian strategy, Strategy is an art and a science. 
So how to implement it in your particular area is going to require some finesse and analysis. Yet, again, that overarching structure of how it would work, you have to have the capacity to sever the contract unilaterally if you no longer feel that your market provider is abiding by the terms that you had agreed. That's the main thing, is to understand that self-governance is going to require personal engagement. What that level of engagement is will be dependent upon the circumstances locally. Um, the question that I have is um, especially for Safedin, but not exclusively. Um, you're probably familiar with the money speech of Ayn Rand, where she um, calls money being the uh, barometer of society's virtue. Um, following that, can you imagine that a Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general um, can cause a rise in society's virtue? Um, I think so, yeah. Um, I, I kind of make this case in the Bitcoin standard and in my next book, The Fiat Standard. I think, um, um, I think the corruption of money, um, well, in, in very simple terms, when money is a free market good, nobody forces you to accept any form of money, then the only way that you can make money in that kind of system is if you provide others with value. And so you live your life, you know, the greedier you are, um, the more you want to make more money, the more you want to serve others. So I think, and, and I really think you can see this, uh, you can glean it from looking at the cultures of different places. So in times of hard money, you see that people in society are focused on providing value for each other and providing services for each other. People have real jobs, they wake up, they have a work ethic, and because, because that's the only way that you can eat, you have to provide value for others. When you corrupt that and when you make it so that, first of all, the producer uh, witnesses their wealth disappear. So yeah, you've worked and you provided value for others, but next year it's worth 10% less because you know the government had to print money in order to finance all of the things that it wants to finance. On the one hand, you're discouraging or honest work because you're taxing it and reducing the uh, reward for it. And on the other hand, you're providing a lot of income for people who are not doing honest, productive work that is rewarded on the market. So you have a lot of people in fiat societies that don't produce anything of value. They sit in offices in um, jobs that are essentially guaranteed by government fiat, whether it's in the private or the public sector, and they receive their salary regardless of how well they serve and how well they do their job. And you see this um, all over the world. You see it in advanced societies where they have the uh, powerful money printer and that allows them to pay a lot of their population. But you also see it in very poor societies where a big chunk of the population lives off the uh, foreign aid that comes into the country and they don't have to work real jobs because they live off the printers of foreign countries. And in fact, it's a serious problem in poor countries because all the smartest, not all, but a lot of the smartest, most capable, most talented people, instead of getting real jobs, serving others, being valuable to society, they just want to get a job in the local aid organization writing reports that nobody reads because that secures the money from the money printer of the foreign country that is the donor. So those two things, I think, are massively corrosive of the work ethic of society. Um, and, and it makes sense, you know, money is the coordinating mechanism of the economic society. Money is how we perform economic calculation. And when you're corrupting money so deeply, you're corrupting economic value, you're corrupting people's conception of economic value, and you're giving people the incentive not to work at, uh, n not to focus on serving each other and not to work to the benefit of society but to figure out how do I get rich, how do I get my share of the money printer. And the longer this goes on, the more that the parasites are rewarded at the expense of productive people, the more the culture of parasitism prevails, spreads, and increases, and the less that the culture of productive work um, uh, spreads and the more it recedes. So I think um, Bitcoin offers us a way out of this because um, you know, and, and of course the, the amazing thing about Bitcoin is that it's not like we need to get the government, we need to vote for the right government that will force society to accept Bitcoin. It's a spontaneous market phenomenon that is emerging on its own that's rewarding people who save in Bitcoin, that's rewarding people who get back to the natural order of money, who get back to the natural order of society and work and save. And um, it's effectively devaluing government money. Um, it's not yet at that point because it's still very small, but if you think about it, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, if it, uh, 
10, 20, 30 years from now, as it increases in value, it's going to eat up in uh, of the it's going to eat up the ability of government to finance itself through inflation because it's going to devalue government currency further and further. Either it's going to force f um, monetary discipline on governments, or it's going to help in the collapse of national government currencies as they resort to more and more economic printing and people have an exit out of it. So, I am quite optimistic about this. Um, I think. And, and I don't see it as if it's Bitcoin being this magical cure in as much as it is, this is the natural order of society, always has been. And this is what normal functioning money brings about. And this is what fiat money in the 20th century destroyed. This is what statism and democracy and high time preference um, caused by fiat money brought about and destroyed in the 20th century, creating all these massive governments uh, that we heard about and all of their drive towards centralization and power. So yeah, I would think so, yeah. Yeah, this is also for uh, Safadai. You could also argue that people had the choice before uh, by choosing gold to choose a hard currency and they rejected it or maybe they were yeah, weaned off it or somehow that failed, that opportunity failed. How would you think that in this case in Bitcoin that would not happen? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's um, kind of one of the focuses of my next book, The Fiat Standard. I think there are two reasons, really, why um, Bitcoin can fix this where gold failed. And the first one is you can't send gold anywhere um, further than your arm without having to trust somebody else to do it for you. And that just means that you need extensive physical infrastructure for the clearance, for the secure clearance of gold. And that just means that you have a honeypot for governments to take over, which is what the central bank is. So um, if you think about it, and the way that I think of it in uh, the fiat standard, I could discuss it in terms of the saleability across space. How much does your money lose in its value as you send it across space? In the case of gold, the further you want to send gold around the world, the more you have to pay. So if you wanted to send gold from New York to London, you're going to lose something between 0.1 and 1% of the value of the gold in the shipping and transportation and verification and the insurance of uh, the sending of the gold. So as a result, obviously, uh, you know, you're not going to have uh, all transactions of gold settled um, individually. You batch all of these transactions and then central banks will settle with one another with one big uh, shipment of gold at the end of the month or the year or something like that. So because of the very high cost of moving gold around, naturally gold tends towards centralization and centralization leaves it vulnerable for capture. So governments can just come in, take over the gold, give you pieces of paper, and then what are you going to do? You have the pieces of paper, all the gold was captured. And even, even if they don't capture the gold, you know, you're kind of stuck with their monopoly where they can issue more fiduciary media than gold that, that they have because y your, cent your local central bank is your only mechanism for trading with the rest of the world. If you try and take your gold out and tell them, okay, I don't want this paper, I want the gold, well, what you have is essentially useless as a monetary asset outside of your own town. You know, you can take it to pay for people uh, in your own town, but if you wanted to buy something from abroad, you can't really send it. So you're reliant on these monopoly institutions in the case of central banking with gold, which at the beginning of the 20th century, you know, you had maybe 40, 50 central banks around the world. That was it. There was 40, 50 central banks able to perform final settlement with one another. And so it was highly centralized and highly capable of, of being taken over by government. Bitcoin, I think, in its current form, allows us to have something in the range of tens of thousands of central banks that are able to settle with one another internationally at a tiny fraction of the cost of moving gold around. So, you know, you can still, you can send Bitcoin right now, you can send a billion dollars of Bitcoin from New York to London and you pay about a one dollar transaction fee. Um, I'm sure the transaction fees are going to go up significantly over time, but it's still going to be a tiny fraction of a billion dollars that you're sending in terms of value. So because of this, I think Bitcoin is naturally going to be far more decentralized and far harder to capture. And that's the first advantage. The second advantage is um, what I'd like to call Bitcoin's number go up technology. Um, gold is already an asset worth around $10 trillion. There's already about $10 trillion of gold being held everywhere. And so if we were to dump all national currencies and everybody were to move toward using gold, the 
uh, gold will appreciate significantly. It'll go from being about $10 trillion to maybe $100 trillion in terms of its market value. So it goes up about 10 per tenfold in the best case scenario. Maybe it'll go up twofold, threefold, something like that. But in the case of Bitcoin, Bitcoin is starting from a very, very small base. So the incentive to get in is much higher for people because the potential for it to increase, if it does go up to, you know, it's, it's less than a trillion today. If it does go up to about a hundred trillion, that's a hundredfold. And um, if it goes up to 10 trillion, if it becomes equal to gold, it'll be 10x larger than it is today. So um, an increase of $1 trillion of demand for gold will cause a 10% rise in price. An increase of $1 trillion of demand in Bitcoin is going to cause a doubling of price, roughly. So because gold is tiny and it's, uh, sorry, because Bitcoin is tiny and it has a very small capitalization, it has an enormous potential for appreciation which can be more attractive for people. So the barriers towards this happening for gold is that it's hard to move gold around and there's not a lot of um, financial incentive for the appreciation of gold to draw investors into gold in the same kind of excited way that you see people getting into Bitcoin today. One additional remark to uh, moving gold to and fro. I, if there would be a really free market in money, presumably there would be a lot of money warehouses showing up where people would deposit their, their physical gold and you would receive um, on your app uh, a monetary certificate. You know, on your app you could uh, bank basically. And, uh, and then you would presumably have some settlement locations, centers, let's say in Europe and in Japan and in the United States. And um, th this settlement wouldn't necessarily involve the physical movement every day, every week. Maybe they would settle half a year and th th if they would see there's no drawdown in terms of physical gold, then they would settle maybe once a year. That would bring costs of uh, transactions in digital in digitalized gold balances down. So I, I think it would still be competitive. And for instance, the, um, the Perth Mint in Australia offers such a service for, for those who are interested how it works, can go to a website and, and, and look it up. And I mean, it's, it's very important to know that the gold standard was not abolished because it didn't work. The reason was governments wanted inflation and gold stood in the way. And, and also, it is important to note, still, governments want to control our money. And once a, an alternative to the fiat currencies that, they are out, that uh, circulate, the government will come and kill, try to kill it, that's for sure. They will discourage the use of uh, using, let's say, gold or silver or bitcoin. They will do everything they can. The only solution to this is getting rid of governments or a large majority of people finding it interesting and being in favor of a free market in money. But as long as the state, as it is today, uh, I cannot really imagine that the fiat currencies through a market-driven process will be driven out of business. And what I, what I put out, I mean, the uh, governments expand further and further as we as we talk today and uh, so the first step for a free market and money is a change in the mindset of the people i think it's not just a technological advantage that can do the trick yeah. Yeah. i have a comment myself on on the gold versus bitcoin thing um first of all i, I think we should be rejoicing in the appearance of honest money it's money based on truth and math after a hundred years, and it, it really bothers me when even some of the best of us uh, try to armchair uh, define what is money. Or Bitcoin may, be, may become money or may be money. I have used Bitcoin as money. So it's, it's human action what defines something as money. And we have used seashells. How can Bitcoin not be money? And gold has already failed us. It, in, a, in, a, in a year, a couple of years, where, where uh, 25 percent of all, or more, more than one fourth of all dollars in human history have been printed, uh, gold lost around 10 percent of its value. 
So it's already failed us, not because there's anything wrong with gold, but because it's easy to censor. And it's under censorship since 1933 or even before that. Yeah, I'll just uh, add, uh, I, I would probably go even further than Professor Pauli. I'd say that if we did have a free market in money, if you know tomorrow all of the world is taken over by classical liberal governments that don't care what money you use and they give the world free choice, I would uh, give a very significant probability for uh, a global gold standard emerging. And um, I think it would probably, it, it, there's a good chance that it would be very bad for Bitcoin because we already have $10 trillion of gold out there. So gold has a much bigger liquidity pool. It has a much bigger uh, first mover advantage. People are familiar with it. People's cultures and religions and traditions and marriage and dowry and all of that stuff is intertwined with gold and with specific measurements of gold. So I think in a totally free market, you know, gold's advantage, gold's first mover advantage is quite significant over Bitcoin, but we don't live in that world. And we live in a world in which governments uh, want to take over. Uh, not only do they want to protect their fiat currencies, they want to, as Professor Poliet was saying, you know, they want to move us to a world of one, one international fiat currency controlled by one board, one central planning board. So we're headed in that direction. and. Uh, Bitcoin is kind of our only escape hatch. It's our only insurance policy against this. It's our only way. It's, it's the lifeboat, really. And um, uh, we, we, I think the dangerous thing about a lot of the uh, criticisms of Bitcoin is that, um, you know, you're standing on a sinking boat and you're considering whether the lifeboat's colors match your clothes. Um, <laughs> it's a lifeboat. It's the difference between life and death. Uh, would it be nicer if it was pink or if it was yellow, if it was orange, perhaps, but it'll get you to safety. That's what really matters. <laughs> Keep you busy. Um, I, um, I think it's important to note what money is. You know, money is the universally accepted means of exchange. And if you, with your trading partner, use Bitcoin, it doesn't make Bitcoin money. It's important mon to note that money is the uh, unit of account, you know, for pricing purposes, for making economic calculation. And uh, as I noted earlier, the productive power of money is optimized if all people use the same unit of account. If you use Bitcoin, I use gold, and you use silver, we are still in a state of barter economy. And that is something people want to overcome. We, we, people want to have a single unit of account. And I'm pretty sure if we have a free market in money, if I would have a button I can press and would start a free market in money on a global scale, it wouldn't take long that people go for a single unit of account, the ultimate means of payment, maybe it's gold then, but they wouldn't be dealing with all sorts of different units of accounts and means of exchange. I think that the, the competition out there is really for who provides global money in the future. So far, I'm concerned it will be the cartel of states, and we get a fiat single currency. It's a quite dystopian uh, <laughs> perspective, but um, there is this tendency towards pushing out all uh, units of account which do not live up to the standard of being money. And um, that's why I think it's important, you know, to, to, to get that clear. Uh, Bitcoin is not yet money. It is a means of exchange that is used by some people. The dollar is very, is very close to the world currency at the moment because all kinds of people use the dollar to make uh, financing transactions, to make pur purchases and goods and services. And uh, yeah, I think it's important to know what, what, what money is. I have one question. Uh, do you think with gold certificates or with paper gold, aren't the banks are printing out uh, gold out of thin air and uh, what percentage of gold demand is directed to paper gold? I mean, not physically backed. Yeah, very, um, a very important uh, question. At the moment, many institutional investors 
consider holding physical gold an equivalent, as an equivalent to holding gold futures, for instance. So if they have to take up a hedge position, they typically even decide for gold futures, so paper gold. It's not backed by physical gold. And this market is huge. And this market actually determines the price of physical gold. And so you are well advised, if you, if you go for gold, to buy it in physical form and don't buy it as a gold certificate. Because if you buy a gold certificate, uh, it is backed by gold futures. If you buy a gold ETF, you have to, to see whether it's backed by 100% physical gold or not. But f holding physical gold is important for you to be on the safe side because all the paper gold instruments have certain risks, counterparty risks, etc. And in April 2020, something very interesting happened. Normally, the paper market gold price equals the price in the physical market. But because of this huge uncertainty back then, the lockdown and the gold couldn't be moved logistically from one continent to the other, there was a decoupling between the paper money gold price and the physical gold price. Physical gold traded at a premium, at a very high premium. And um, this is actually a good example to show where the breaking point in, 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 this, in this game is. Once people lose faith in in, in, the, in, the, in the fiat currency system and all the instruments that have been built up on this paper money pyramid, then at some point the link between the physical gold market and the paper gold market will break. And uh, you as an investor should be aware that there are risks. You will be on the safe side if you hold physical gold in, in forms of bars and, and coins. Um, I have a question to Tim Hafner. Uh, first of all, um, thank you very much for giving us this interesting insight on the economics of a militia um, based on this uh, Japanese example. Um, my question is as follows. Can you imagine a um, private law society developing on the base of a private military company, um, especially, for example, in the case of a desperate government um, seeking help in the case of a total chaos? What, what type of government? Say a, a private law society basically developing on the base of a private military company. I think private military companies, number one, they exist now, they've existed all throughout history and they'll continue to exist. Could a private law society evolve from that? Well, again, we have to look not necessarily to the company, but to the culture. And the people need to recognize their responsibility to self-govern and not to completely farm out those security functions to any contracted solution. And so the idea, and I referenced the United States Constitution because I'm an American and it is a good document with regard to these particular aspects that the whole body of the people need to be organized, armed and disciplined and that discipline is the most important piece because it's a culture and to refer back to the earlier question how can we create change especially Europeans that might not have a second amendment, might not have a militia within their operating charters of their government, if one even exists. It's to start to honor and value that armed, organized, and disciplined character. So perhaps instead of subsidizing sports that involve chasing a ball, that you subsidize sports that involve militia-related activities. To start to bring esteem to people that are organized and disciplined and then the arms can also follow. So I wouldn't put faith in any private solution like a private military company but again it's more about culture and so many other social issues can be solved once that cultural piece is addressed. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Japanese society being a polite society. I think it was armed or was it secure? What was the basis for the uh, for, uh, polite society and uh, what about how they behave outside of Japan? 
I would premise, uh, preface my statement by saying for a long time there were no good guys. But Japanese culture evolved over a thousand years of warrior leadership and at certain points the legislation allowed for the warrior class to cut down a commoner for any reason. Now it didn't happen very much but there are incident instances of it and the fact that it was legal to do so. Again, as we indicated, when your life is on the line, you're going to act very polite and not provide any offense, just as a matter of self-preservation. So not using that as the example to move forward in the future so that there's one class, that warrior class was embedded in law to have certain privileges. That's to be avoided in the future. What we need is an armed equilibrium in which no one will be able to provide that type of offense and nobody will be able to enjoy that type of legal privilege to impose upon anyone else. That being said, over a thousand years you can see that cultural change so that they do become extremely polite so as to not cause any offense. And I think that's something that we can look to in terms of the type of culture we want to exist in. And what does it have to do with uh, their behavior outside of Japan? It was the same people. Can you uh, give the, me an example? The, war, the, the, the atrocities of, uh, I mean, was it uh, particularly atrocious how they behaved against uh, uh, Chinese and uh, in, the, in the later wars, in the Korean War and uh, all of these? Yeah, and so the examples during World War II, the Great Pacific War and, and their conquest, that was a very, I'll use the term bastardized version of what's known as the Samurai Code, which is largely a, a fiction of the 20th century. So they took some of those samurai values and kind of manipulated them to honor the imperial state and then send those folks overseas with that very mutated form of virtue and then impose it upon anyone that wasn't them. So again, that, that's the ugly side of samurai culture that was again bastardized, incorporated into the state and then set loose so that those Japanese troops during the war went overseas and looked at everyone else as being beneath them. Again, that's to be avoided. In the vein of asking about values, and this is a question for all panelists, um, what values have you seen in foreign cultures that you went or made you go like, mm, maybe we should adopt that at home. And please feel free to answer everybody because they're always interested in that. I'll just want, use one example. I was in Romania and I bought some candles from a street vendor and I said, keep the change. And they said, no, 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 you're going to get your change back. They wanted to give the impression that they would not accept anything more but an exchange of value for value. I think that's something to be honorable and, and admirable and adopted elsewhere. Maybe it's just a, a footnote, Tim. Uh, in an exchange, you surrender something you consider less valuable and receive something you consider of more value. So, he, I mean, the Romanian guy did the right thing and you too, but uh, it was uh, not an uh, equivalent of, of, of values that were exchanged, right? So, yeah. Yeah, well, you gave something you considered less valuable and received something you considered more valuable. Yeah, it was not an equivalence of value. Just value for, yeah. The, the point that I was trying to make is that there's problems with corruption and Romania has its own issues and I saw, I was actually really moved when I was in Romania to feel what it was like in that environment where they were trying to claw their way out of their communist past. And so I felt like I was being charitable by saying keep the change, but they wanted to, the, the regular people wanted to let me know that they weren't about corruption and they didn't want to receive anything more than what they had asked for. And I thought that was honorable. Um, I think, um, um, you know, 
perhaps one uh, one aspect of um, um, Arab culture which I think is uh, could benefit from learning from the West is probably the the, the culture of saving and uh, long term provision. It's not that common. It is common and people will save, but it's not as common as it is in the West. I think it's, uh, but it's also becoming less and less common in the West, unfortunately. Um, it's getting less and less common everywhere. But I think uh, there's, there's a lot of emphasis uh, culturally on, um, you know, the, the, the good values and the good traits, but there's not much uh, emphasis in many places on the low time preference aspect of just uh, sacrifice the present for the future. Um, I think this is something that everywhere in the world could benefit from, perhaps. Well, just to add to the discussion, I think cultural change is, is low, and sometimes the people that have the picture very clear are not the best advocating or doing the marketing of ideas, etc. So I think uh, liberty is going to come through innovation, rather, and I see th inventions like Bitcoin precisely as a sort of Mengerian institutions that we are creating as we go. So innovation is going to do more for freedom in the future. It doesn't look like that at the moment because the state is using technology to oppress us even more right now. But in the future, we're going to innovate into freedom. It's going to be, that, that's going to be faster than persuading other people into freedom. Yeah, I have a question to Juan um, regarding the actual time of COVID. So the body represents capital. And I think it's a, it's a good time to support that hypothesis. So if you have, so to speak, increased your capital, then you have a, a different reaction probably to, to this threat. Now, my question, I have a, a very strange hypothesis, a very dangerous one. Now that we live in a time of capital consumption, <laughs> um, we have this beautiful vaccination uh, escape, so to speak. So there is absolutely no debate about this capital element uh, of the body. So there is no responsibility to look after your own health. So you have a high time preference solution, which is the vaccine, and it immediately solves all, all problem. And my question is, or could you comment on, on um, a feeling that I have uh, concerning this spiritual element of capital consumption? Couldn't it be that the vaccine is actually a real danger to that capital because we are in this capital consumption time. So basically the body is consumed by the vaccination so that in the future, it's a hypothesis of course, in the future we will see very bad signs, uh, Nebenwirkungen, so I don't know in, in English, uh, side effects uh, of it uh, that really puts your body in danger. Could you comment on that? Yeah, certainly the incentives are in place. It's, we live in a very sad moment in human history where all, all, the, all these mercantilistic incentives, we, we know there's not only big pharma, we have big health, we have big food, uh, we have a destruction of, of, of uh, not only the family but the individual at the, at the, at the, corporal, uh, at the corporal level. So, and now it's a conspiracy theory. When uh, the students of classical liberalism and, and Austro-Libertarianism have known this for decades, there are horrible incentives towards the you know, short-term use of the body. There's, um, even in the medical profession, the, the, the medical doctors have probably one, one course, one semester on nutrition. They are not focused on prevention. They are not focused on long-term uh, health. It's all about patches and, and solutions or maybe solutions. It depends on the case. So certainly the, all the bad incentives or the disincentives are in place for, for this mess. This, this, uh, we know that most people affected with certain, certain uh, um, illnesses are, are obese or, or have other you know, comorbidities and uh, th this has been totally ignored because it places again 
individual responsibility at, at the center, and of course it places uh, the state as the source of these evils and, and, and uh, you know, uh, misincentives.